Good morning. I'd like to set a scene for you. It is 1978, and the 10 and 7 Atlanta Falcons and the 9 and 8 Philadelphia Eagles are facing off in the wild card round of the NFC playoffs. Philadelphia was leading 13 to 0 going into the fourth quarter when Atlanta scored 14 unanswered points to take the lead. With two seconds remaining in the game, Philadelphia had the ball in field goal range and sent out the field goal unit. Mike Michelle, the place kicker for the Eagles, lined up for the field goal. The ball is snapped, the ball is down, the kick is up, but it veers to the left of the goalpost. Falcons players leap for joy while Mike Michelle falls to the ground in disgust of himself. A linebacker for the Falcons by the name of Greg Brezina kneeled quietly beside Michelle and said, Mike, what I'm about to say to you may not make any sense, but it doesn't really make any difference whether you made the kick or missed it. What matters far more is whether you have peace in your heart, which comes from Jesus Christ. So the important thing we see here is Jesus Christ. If your life is spaced out or strung out, you feel like it's at the end. He can take these broken fragments of your life and piece it all back together. For he is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life. John 14, 1 through 6. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going, and how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. On the evening of Jesus' crucifixion, he sat down with his disciples to have the Passover meal with them, and during this evening is when Judas arises to betray him. Jesus told his disciples that he uh, would be betrayed and then put to death, and he comforts his disciples by giving them the knowledge they will need to make it through this time. He speaks concerning the place where he is going in verse 2, and he tells them that this place is prepared for them as well in verse 3. Thomas then asks, how do we get there? What is the way? And Jesus' answer is one of the most beloved and quoted scriptures to the faithful. I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's one of the many I am statements from the book of John, like I am uh, the bread of life, I am the true vine. And there are several others, but these I am statements indicate us uh, more of who Jesus was and who he is. So the first part of that verse, verse 6, I am the way. Jesus is the way, and there are only two ways. If you would please turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30 with me. I'll have most of the scriptures up here, but this is rather lengthy. So Deuteronomy chapter 30. And I'll be reading 15 through 20. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 15 through 20. See, I have set before you today life and good, death and evil, and that I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commandments, his statutes, and his judgments, that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land which you go to possess. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land which you crossed over the Jordan to go in and possess. I call heaven and earth as witnesses today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice and that you may cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days and that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give them. And in Matthew chapter 6, we're given an example of two masters. In verse 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. In just the next chapter, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus gives us a choice. A choice of two gates. Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leads to destruction. There are many who go and buy it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Jesus' way is the straight way. In context of this, this is the narrow, the straight means narrow or difficult. And as we just read, Jesus' way is the straight and narrow way. And as he warns us, and we're warned multiple times in the scriptures, being a Christian is a struggle. In verse 14, he says, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way. Or we're warned multiple other times, uh, 2 Timothy 3 and 12, yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. In 1 John 3 and 13, do not marvel, my brethren, if the world 
hates you. And being a Christian requires a lot of effort and sacrifice. We're, uh, we're told this in Luke 9 and 23. Then he said to them all, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. This is the way of the Christians. In Acts 16 and verse 17, the girl followed Paul and us uh, and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high God who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And in Acts 18 and verse 26, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Aquila and Priscilla heard them. They took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And Acts 24 and verse 14. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. So there's only two ways. Jesus' way is the straight and narrow way. This is the way of the Christians, and this is the way to heaven. Matthew 7, 14, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are a few who find it. And those that walk this road will receive eternal life. Romans uh, 2 and verse 7, eternal life to those who by patient continuousness and doing good seek for glory, honor, and immortality. So Jesus is the way. And Jesus is the truth. Jesus is the word of God. In John chapter 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he skipped down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. In John 8 and verse 31, then Jesus said to those Jews who believed him, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. So Jesus is the Word of God, and as we all know, the Word of God is truth. In John 17 and verse 17, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. In Psalm 119 and 160, the entirety of your word is truth, and every one of your righteous judgments endures forever. And 1 Thessalonians 2 and 13, For this reason we also thank God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard from us, you welcomed it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which also effectively works in you who believe. The truth makes us free from, or, yeah, the truth makes us free from sin. I got ahead of myself for a second. John 8 and 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Romans 8 and verse 2, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. In Galatians 5 and 1, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So Jesus is the word of God. The word of God is truth. The truth makes us free from sin. And ultimately, the truth brings us to heaven. Those who live by the truth have their names written in the book of life. In Philippians 4 and 3, And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Those who overcome will remain in the book of life. In Revelation 3 and verse 5, he who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the book of life, but I will confess his name before my fathers and before his angels. But those who reject the truth will not be found in the book of life. Revelation 20 and verse 5, But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Jesus is the way, the truth, and finally, Jesus is the life. Without him, there is no life. God and Jesus, he is creator. John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And he upholds all things by the word of his power. In Hebrews 1 and verse 3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And in all things, in him all things consist, Colossians 1 and 17. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. There is, however, a great death coming. This death is the result of sin. Romans 6 and 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. This death is eternal separation from God. 
Revelation 21 and 8. But the cowardly, unbelieving, abominable, murderers, sexual immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And the ungodly are those who will suffer the second death. 2 Peter 3 and 7. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Fortunately, though, Jesus gives salvation from the second death, which is eternal life. Romans 6, 23. For the wage of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hebrews 7, 25. Therefore, he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. Finally, John 10 and verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal to ki- and to kill and to destroy. I have come that, you may, that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus' statement after proclaiming that he is the way, the truth, and the life was, no man comes to the Father except through me. Statement means all and only. All those who come by Jesus may come to the Father, and only those who come by Jesus may come to the Father. At this point, I'll turn things over to Ben. I can't follow that. Very well done, son. I'm not just saying it because my son. I thought it was actually a very well presentation. Um, I told him, I said, no. Now, don't drag it out too long because we only have so much time and I got to get up and talk. And like everybody's like, oh, yeah, we hear you all the time. So, <laughs> um, Actually, uh, you could have taken a little bit longer. <laughs> Very good. You know, I was thinking uh, I'd, I'd prepare notes for this because we kind of coordinated ahead of time. But as I, I do call audibles a good bit, it depends on what I feel is uh, the right message to, to bring. And uh I would like to actually uh, turn your attention, before I say anything in my notes, I'd like to turn your attention back to Exodus chapter 14. Luke is talking about John chapter 14 and verse 6. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There are actually uh, a number of passages of Scripture or thoughts in Scripture that kind of that uh, more or less relay that idea. And this one, I think, really underscores this idea very well. Because we are talking about eternal life. When Jesus uh, give, gave that statement, there is only one way. There is only one truth. There is only one life. You might remember the uh, history in Exodus of the children of Israel being in captivity in Egypt. And they uh, were led out by Moses after the tenth and final plague, the Death of the firstborn over Egypt, he led them out, and Pharaoh let them go. Pharaoh, being the ruler of Egypt, being such an evil and hard man whose heart continually was hardened, even whenever God humbled him, and he, he even mentioned a couple times, Pharaoh actually said, I have sinned a couple times, but he, he just couldn't quite turn that corner, and his heart would go back to the way it was immediately, and he was hardened, and he, he uh, despised the children of Israel, and he chased after them. In chapter 14, it says this, And it says in verse 3 of chapter 14, Pharaoh will say to the children of Israel, they are bewildered by the land. The wilderness has closed them in. Then I will harden Pharaoh's heart. This is what God says. So that he will pursue them and I will gain honor over Pharaoh and over all his army that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. And uh, he told them where where to go and to camp by the sea in the first couple of verses. Now it was told the king of Egypt that the people had fled and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned against the people. And they said, why, why, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. Also, he took 600 choice chariots and all the chariots of Egypt with captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he pursued the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with boldness. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and uh, chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen, his army, and overtook them camping by the sea beside uh, Pi. Heheroth before Baal Zephon. And I'm sure that's exactly how those are pronounced too. You can Google that and see if I'm right. I want you to see the, uh, see this scene in modern terms. Imagine that you were in captivity and you were allowed to uh, to finally leave. You're leaving. There's the, the whole group of you. Imagine had it been 
uh, in Nazi Germany, and, and, and history was a little bit different than the way it turned out. And you were, uh, you know, Hitler lets you go, and you're marching out, and all of a sudden he changes his mind, and he pursues you, not with chariots, but with tanks. He pursues you with the armored vehicles, and he's coming at you, and you are going to die. Is that scary? They thought of that. Is that scary? Do you think you can withstand that onslaught? Not a chance. Well, the chariots of Pharaoh's day would have been the, uh, the mechanized mobile weaponry of their day. The children of Israel were very much afraid about this. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, verse 10, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were very afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. Uh, th then they said to Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, have you taken us away to die in the wilderness? Why have you so dealt with us to bring us up out of Egypt? Is this not the word that we told you in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. <clears throat> God had freed them. They were in captivity. And now they're free people. But their hearts continually turned back to their captivity. They continued to turn back. They were afraid outside of that. They didn't trust God outside of that. They didn't trust Moses. Their, their comfort zone was captivity. Let that sink in. Let the, think that through. Their comfort zone was in captivity. And now that they're out here and they're going to incur the, the, the wrath of Pharaoh, all hope is lost. And Moses said to the people, this is one of the greatest statements in all of Scripture, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. Stand still. First of all, do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. This is going to happen. God specifically told them, he says, Moses, you take them and you park them right by the sea. That's a really dumb place to put people. And I mean, there's no way to get out. There's no escape. You have hemmed them in. There is no other way to go. So you have them pinched against the sea. Pharaoh's army is bearing down. There is no escape from this. Why would God set them up like this? Because he's going to show them that he is God. He's going to show them that he is God. Had they been able to escape another way and God was with them and blessed them during that escape and, that, uh, and their freedom, might some of them say that they saved themselves? Isn't that the same thing that he told Gideon? Remember that? In, in the book of Judges, he tells Gideon to, to select all the men of war. And, and there's just too many. He says, too many people. Thousands of fighting men. And they're going to go up against the Midianites. It was 10,000 strong. And God told Gideon to test the men with a simple test of how they drank water, whether they got down and lapped it up like a dog or scooped it in their hands. And he said, the ones that scoop it in their hands, basically, you select those men to fight the battle. The rest of them you send home. How many people were left? 300. 300 people. 300 Hebrews are going to go up against 10,000 Midianites. And why did God say? He said that he did that on purpose. Why did he whittle it down to that point? So that no one can say, my hand has saved me. That you know that God alone has saved you. And that's exactly why he hasn't pinched against the Red Sea here. Now, there's a innumerable host that is suggested possibly there might have been a few million people among the Hebrews at this time. I don't know if there were a few million. I don't think there were a few million uh, Egyptians coming after them. But one thing I've known from history is that just a very small, tyrannical group of, group of people can enslave and murder millions of innocent people. You don't have to be a greater body of people to take over people. You just have to strike enough fear in them. The Egyptians certainly did that, didn't they? And so they're scared literally to death. And God says, stand still, calm down, relax. And see the salvation of the Lord that he's going to perform today. God's got this. And nobody's going to stop it. God's got this and nobody's going to stop it. The Lord will fight for you, verse 14 says, and you shall hold your peace. You just be calm and just see what happens. And so the Lord said to Moses, why do you cry to me? Tell the children of Israel to go forward, but lift up your rod and stretch out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. Now, without that little qualifier, wouldn't that seem a little weird? Why are you crying out to me? Tell them to move on. But Lord, there's water there. 
Anybody here uh, have trouble swimming? Because it looks like we're going to be treading water for a little bit. No, that's not what he had in mind. He's telling them the water's not going to stop you. I will make a way of escape. I will provide a way. Mike, what is your invitation song title? Well, say it. <laughs> the Lord will make a way, right? The Lord will make a way. How appropriate that is, Mike. The Lord will make a way. And that's exactly what he's done here. And so it says that in, uh, and he says, I indeed will harden the hearts of the Egyptians and they will follow after them. And I will gain my honor over Pharaoh and over all his, his army, his chariots and his horsemen. Then the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I have gained honor for myself over Pharaoh, his chariots and his horsemen. And the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel moved and went behind them. The pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. So it be, came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. Thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one and it gave light by night to the other so that the one did not come near the other all that night. Now before the water would be divided and before there would be a way God would provide, He protected them from harm. And so Moses stretched out his hand over the, the sea. Verse 21, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground and the waters were a wall to them on their right hand and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued them and went after them in the midst of the sea. All Pharaoh's horses, his chariots and his horsemen. Now it came to pass in the morning, in the morning watch, that the, the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of the fire and cloud, and he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels so that he drove them with great difficulty. And the Egyptians said, let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. I want you to, to notice here that the fear was not <clears throat> over for the Israelites. The water's divided, the ground is dry, they can pass through, they're not going to get bogged down in mud. God has made sure that it was passable, 100% passable. And they're going along, but God didn't hold the Egyptians back. He held them back for a bit and then he let them loose. And here they come chasing after him. They're going to gain on him. These people are probably mostly on foot. And so what God did was cause a great deal of difficulty. As you said, the chariot wheels would come off. They're driving with great difficulty. You ever been in a traffic jam before? I imagine that that caused a good bit of, you know, a juggernaut a bit. Why would God do all of that? Is he ever showing the children of Israel that on every second at every level of your fear, I've got this. And so it says the Lord said to Moses, and, and oh, by the way, did you notice that even the Egyptians, many of the Egyptians are starting to figure out who God really is? Did you notice that? How many plagues were over Egypt? There were 10, right? And we don't have time to talk about this this morning. We have mentioned it in the past. But each of those ten plagues was an attack by God against a vital God of the Egyptians. Every one of them. Darkness over the land, water turning to blood, things like that. All of that, uh, there was some reference to an Egyptian God that they held in the highest regard. God's way of basically mocking their false gods and defeating them. And the Egyptians now know who are in pursuit of the Israelites. They are at this moment now, they're terrified and they realize that the, that the Hebrew God is God. Anyone here ever see Cecil B. DeMille's Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston playing Moses? It's an old one. It's like one of the first movies in color, probably. It was a really old movie, right? It's like back in the 50s. Yule Brenner played Pharaoh. Charlton Heston played Moses. And there was a statement that Yul Brynner said as, as Pharaoh in that statement. It's not a direct quote, obviously, from Scripture, but what he said is absolutely biblical. He's frustrated because of what God has done to his people through all those plagues. And he says this one rarely profound thing. He says, his God is God. That's just powerful. Yeah, it rhymes. It's powerful. His God is God. And that's very true. That's the conclusion the Egyptians came to. And isn't it is, is something, they come to this conclusion, but even too late for them. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians on their chariots and on their horsemen. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And when the morning appeared, the sea returned to its full depth while the Egyptians were fleeing into it. And if you think that's weird, why were they running into the water if it's collapsing? It, didn't, it wasn't like it was falling in and they're like, hey guys, let's go swimming. It wasn't that. 
You remember 9-11, how many firemen were racing into the falling buildings? It happened all of a sudden. This happened all of a sudden. So the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Then the waters returned and covered the chariots, the horsemen, and all the, uh, all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. Not so much as one of them remained. But the children of Israel had walked on dry land in the midst of the sea. That's impossible that God made a way. And the waters were walled to them on the right hand and on the left. So the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt. So the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Powerful story, isn't it? But it's not just a story. This is a historical account that really happened by the miraculous and divine hand of our creator. Now what's that have to do with John chapter 14 and verse 6 that Luke so capably preached about? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. In what we just read there, God provided only one way to salvation. Jesus now is only one way. It's the only way. There is no other way to get to heaven. You cannot, to get to the Father is to get to heaven. That's the idea. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead, uh, one Godhead, three persons in that. To get to the Father, you have to go through the Son, and to go through the Son, you have to, you have to do something. He provides a way, and you have to take that way. There is no other way. God provided a way for the Israelites, and there was no other. If anyone tried to go a different way, they would have perished. They would have died. The Lord made a way. And he has proven himself to be true the entire time. All of the warnings that he gave the Israelites... And all, the, all, of the, all of the promises of, of, of doom to the Egyptians. All the miracles that, that he had performed over Egypt. And even the miracle. Who can do that? Has anyone seen that? Water dividing like that? And standing there. It was standing there. How long would it take him to cross the Red Sea? Well, it's a really small sea. If it can, Well, yeah, it's not the Pacific, is it? If he's crossing the Pacific, they'd still be in the middle of that thing probably, right? Red Sea wasn't that large, but it, it was large enough. It was a wall. It wasn't some weird anomaly. It was a wall to the right and the left. The ground that they walked on was wide enough for the entire, possibly a couple million people of Israelites to actually cross over on dry ground. It, it, God has ever been true. He has proven himself to be true. When God said, and Moses said on his behalf, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. God's going to do this. Guess what? It happened. Told the truth. That's the whole point. God has told us. He's provided the way. He tells us we have to take the way. Jesus says, I am the way and the truth. You can believe what Jesus says. When Jesus said, I have provided the way, you got to take the way. And he says, I'm the life. Where was life? Now, technically, the Israelites were alive on the bad side of the sea. They were alive in the midst of the sea. And they were alive on the other side of the sea. But when was their salvation from death apparent? It wasn't on the other side of the sea because the Egyptians were there ready to take them down. It wasn't in the midst of the ocean because had God so said and caused the waters to fall upon them, they also would have perished. It was when they came out on the other side and God closed behind them, collapsed the waters, closed behind them the death that followed. And they lived. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And they could not have done that without God. No one could have gotten to the other side except through God, according to God's will. That's very, very important. Now, very quickly, I want you to turn in your New Testament to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. <clears throat> the Apostle Paul actually makes a reference to this event that we just read about. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, he says, Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses into the cloud and in the sea. And he goes on to say some things that pertain to some other, other events that happened during their sojourn as Israelites newly freed from captivity. And... Not that we have time to look into the rest of this for now, but you'll see that they, they kept sinning over and over again, the Israelites did. And it was a warning here by Paul. It says it not once but twice that they were examples for anyone afterward uh, that, they, that we would not follow their, 
their pattern, if you will. But he mentions this here. All of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. Where was the cloud? Where was the cloud in Exodus chapter 14? We notice that it was between the Israelites and the Egyptians. And that's what separated the two groups. And then when the Israelites began to flee through the midst of the Red Sea, somehow, you remember, they pursued them. The cloud was removed. That protective barrier was removed. Where did the cloud go? Way back up in the sky? Where did it go? According to Paul, this is why harmonizing Scripture is so important. According to Paul, the cloud evidently covered them as they were running through the midst of the Red Sea. Now, if you want to get really technical, what is a cloud basically made up of? Water, isn't it? And the more water it's in it, the darker it gets. And the darker it gets, the more propensity there is for you to get wet. (laughs) Because it's coming down, right? They were completely sandwiched in water. They were covered by the cloud. They were in the sea. And Paul calls it a baptism. That is a baptism. Now, there's more we could say on that subject. But the fact of the matter is, Jesus has provided a way. I will make a way for you. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We need to know how to get into Christ, and we need to know how to stay in Christ. We need to know where that salvation is only in Christ. Uh, at another time, we can discuss the uh, global flood of Noah's day. Uh, we've talked about it here many times, but I will share this passage in 1 Peter chapter 3, <clears throat> verses 20 and 21. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Peter, reflecting upon the global flood of Noah's day, he says, when once the long-suffering of God, verse 20, uh, 1 Peter 3, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls were saved through water. Now, let me stop there. Didn't Paul just acknowledge in 1 Corinthians 10 that the children of Israel were saved through water? It was a baptism. And right here, eight souls in the ark were saved through water. Water coming down from above, it rained. The great wells of the deep were broken up, so water came up. They were sandwiched in water. They were immersed in water. And he says, there's also an antitype which now saves us, namely baptism. Not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. God has provided a way by truth that cannot be denied in which we can be saved from certain death and we will have life. And that is only in Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're going to end it now, our our two lessons, part one and part two, with this invitation. We hope that uh, as, as you were here this morning, if there's anyone here who has a desire to commit their life to Christ, and you have a desire to walk with him the rest of your days, realize that no matter who you are or where you are or what the circumstance of your life is, God has provided a way. We all have a red sea of doubt. Everybody has a red sea of doubt. But if we will trust God and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord in our lives, he will make a way for us. And if we will take that way, we believe the truth that he is going to save us, we will have eternal life, which is what Jesus promised. And we will have... Uh, have that and no one can take that away no one can take that away but you can lose it you can give up on it no one can hold a gun to your head and say give up jesus if you're bound and determined that you're going to be willing to die for the lord no one can take away your salvation except you if you abandon him if you turn back if you jump out of the lifeboat of of his safety back into the the sea of sin and death then you can lose your soul yes but nobody can take it from you a promise by God and from God who cannot lie. Titus chapter 1 and verse 2, Hebrews 6 and verse 18. The way, the truth, and the life. Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, if you have uh, a desire to uh, respond to the gospel call this morning, uh, if you want to be baptized into Jesus Christ with the remission of your sins, if you are a Christian and have need to uh, of the prayers of the congregation, we have uh, frequent needs in our personal lives of of prayers of repentance and forgiveness. And if we, if you have such a need, then we're going to sing the song of invitation. And certainly, uh, I, I believe that we are socially distanced enough that if somebody desires to, to come forward, just ask you to sit on the front pew here. And uh, we'll talk, I'll talk with you very privately while we sing. And we'll decide 
together what your what your need is and we'll pray about that and work with you now if you don't feel comfortable doing that then just talk to me after services it's it, it, it everybody doesn't have to be here but if you feel more comfortable with that then we just want to do whatever we can to help you to take your your first or perhaps your next step toward heaven and if uh, you have a desire to do that just at least keep that in your mind seek me out after services and uh and let's talk about it further. But I want you to be thinking about that as we sing this hymn. Brother Mike, if you want to come on up here as he leads us in the hymn 485, I Know the Lord Will Make a Way. So please stand and let's sing this song.